chart so everyone knows about this banner we're talking about. Um, um, it's currently on the north side of the Ames History Museum. So kind of if you're near the public library entrance, you'll be able to see it pretty clearly from, from the street side there. So I just wanted to, everyone to get a little view of that. And we're gonna break down um, the nine individuals that, were that we decided to highlight in the banner and give a little bit more background information about them. <clears throat> so let's start with our first one. James Herman Banning, he was selected because he was the first black aviator to receive a federal pilot's license in 1926 and the first black aviator to complete a coast to coast flight in 1932. Now there were many um, black pilots before Herman Banning got his license, but he was the first to actually get a license from the Federal uh, Commerce Department. And so we kind of recognize him for that sense. <clears throat> now Banning, here's a great, here's kind of the photo that is that was based on on the banner there. And you can see the newspaper from um, the Iowa Bystander, which is actually, it was based out of Des Moines and it was, um, you can kind of see it in the corner here, published in the interest of the colored people. So this was a, a black newspaper out of Des Moines that covered um, kind of Iowa black news. And of course, Herman Banning purchasing his plane was front page news that day. And you can see him, a picture of them with his airplane, Miss Ames. Now, uh, James Herman was born in Oklahoma in either 1899 or 1900. And he graduated from high school in 1918. And after that, he moved to Ames and studied electrical engineering for one year at Iowa State College. So not very long, he was a student. Um, but after that, he owned and operated the Banning Auto Repair Shop in Ames from 1922 to 1928. So mechanics, motors, engines were, were kind of in his blood. And so he kind of, you know, piloting and um, automobiles were right there together. Uh, so he learned to fly while he was working here in Ames. He was able to get pilot's lessons from a World War I aviator down at Raymond Fisher's flying field in Des Moines. And, and then he eventually got his mm -hmm. pilot's license from the Department of Commerce. And then eventually purchased his first biplane and named it, as you can see in this picture, Miss Ames after his uh, town where he learned to fly. In 1928, he moved to Los Angeles to be the chief pilot instructor at the Bessie Coleman Aero Club. Now, Bessie Coleman was probably one of the most famous uh, black and black female aviators of the time at the aviation school there. In 1932, um, he made his biggest uh, accomplishment. Him and mechanic Thomas Cox Allen became the first black men to fly coast to coast across the United States using an used Alexander Eagle Rock biplane that had been modified with spare parts. Um, they dubbed themselves the Flying Hobos because they left with no more than $50 in their pocket. And they kind of just went from town to town. So this wasn't one continuous flight from um, Los Angeles to New York. They stopped every couple states or so. It was a, uh, the whole thing occurred over 21 days and the actual flight time totaled around 42 hours. Unfortunately, banning uh, in 1933, he was scheduled to fly at a, a show at Cap, I'm sorry, Camp Kearney Military Base in San Diego, but he was deemed uh, that because of his race, um, they, well, they would not let him fly. And so instead, a white aviator machinist who was in the Navy operated the plane and unfortunately it went into a tailspin and they never recovered and resulted in, in Herman Banning's death. George Washington Carver. So he's one that maybe a lot of you are familiar with. We're gonna get a little mix of some people maybe you've heard in Ames history or national history, and a few that surprise that you've never heard of and some that we discovered um, doing this project. But George Washington Carver is certainly one of those that um, people are very familiar with. Um, he enrolled in 1892 at Iowa State and was the first black student to attend the college there. He graduated with his BA in agricultural science in 1894 and earned his master's in 1896. <clears throat> um, he actually got here because he was at uh, Simpson College in 1890 to study piano and painting. And Etta Budd, who was from Ames, was an art instructor at Simpson College and convinced him to pursue, uh, pursue a higher education in scientific agriculture. Etta introduced Carver to her father, Professor Joseph Budd, the head of the Iowa State College Horticulture Department, and he got on here. And Carver was also the first black faculty 
at Iowa State after his graduation. He remained there as an assistant botanist for two years. He, um, after that, he was invited by Booker T. Washington to be the director of um, the Department of Agricultural Research at Tuskegee. Now Tuskegee, um, it was Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute, now Tuskegee University. Some of the photos here I want to point out. Um, there's a nice the photo, kind of the collage here of staff officers. That's from one of the Iowa State yearbooks. And you'll see George, George in the bottom right corner of that. And then the building um, at the bottom of the photo is actually, you'll see a highlighted building on the back side, kind of in the middle. That is called North Hall. That is where George lived when he was a student here. Um, at the time, students would have lived in Maine, Maine Hall or Old Maine as we call it today, but he was not allowed to live there. So they found a space for him in the servants' quarters behind Margaret Hall. And Margaret Hall was a women's dormitory there. And um, those buildings are all gone now. They're near McKay Hall. And this is actually the site of LeBaron Hall on campus there. Um, and Carver was really interested. We all know peanuts. Of course, he didn't invent peanut butter. But a lot of his research, his ultimate goal was not to just you know, invent a thousand uses for the peanut. It was to provide black tenant farmers with the opportunity to rise above poverty with crop options rather than cotton. And so finding ways to you know, sustain um, farming down South. And of course we have Carver Hall on Iowa State campus and Carver Plaza with a statue of him there. Now, when we were um, figuring out who, who we thought should be on this banner, George Washington Carver was one of those names that pops up. He's probably one of the, one of the more famous um, black residents here, especially nationally. And we all talk about him being the first a uh, black student at Iowa State, first male black student. And so it kind of asked us the question of, well, who was the first female? And so here we have Juanita Willa Ewing. She was the first female Iowa State graduate, received her bachelor's of science degree in botany in 1926 and her master's of science degree in horticulture in 1935. Um, she wrote her dissertation on um, the mustard plant, so the comparative anatomy of the leaf of Brasilia lucia cos, and it's broad leaved in curled varieties. Now, actually, while we were doing this, we, while we were looking for the first female graduate of Iowa State, we actually, we accidentally or happenstance also found the first female graduate, we believe, of Iowa, or I'm sorry, of Ames High. And you can see in the top left photo there, um, Juanita is featured in the 1921 spirit. Um, she was in the debate club and you can see her front and center there. <clears throat> now, after her time at Iowa State, she moved to Montgomery, Alabama, where she was head of the biology department at Alabama State Teachers College, now Alabama State University. She was very involved with the Delta Sigma Theta sorority, which is a, a black chapter. And she actually um, took many a year long project to get a chapter started at Alabama State and had a pivotal role in making that happen. Her family also had a house on Wood Street. Um, at one point, her mother was working at a fraternity, and so they were able to get housing there and rented out their house on Wood Street to Black Iowa State students who needed a place to live during the Great Depression. Walter Madison owned a plumbing business, helped write the first Iowa plumbing code, and constructed some of Ames's sewer system and in the 1920s fought local racial injustices. Walter was a Texas native who got his degree at, at Tuskegee and continued his education at Iowa State College where he graduated with a bachelor's of science in mechanical engineering in 1914. Now he owned a plumbing and heating business up until 1938 and he constructed a lot of the sewer system at Ames starting in 1916 and 1917 and also help write that plumbing code we mentioned. He was also known for his inventions. Um, you can see one of those on the right. It was a uh, radiator bracket for wall hanging, and it was purchased by the US Army in the late 40s during World War II. Um, Walter was pretty vocal. Um, there's one instance of him in the newspaper of when a traveling uh, play based on the book Uncle Tom's Cabin came to Ames. And he wrote in kind of the op-ed section we call today, um, talking about how inaccurate it was of the black community in 19, this was 1915 when he wrote it, and just saying, we need respect, pure, simple respect, not an abstract something unmerited, but due recognition of our status and the things that measure men. So of course, with 
Uncle Tom's Cabin written in 1852 when slavery was still around, but he was saying that by 1915, the black community was not that same community in 1852. He also in 1922 took a client to the new London restaurant on Main Street in Ames and the proprietor refused to serve them because of the color of his skin. At that time, state of Iowa law prohibited institutions from denying service based on race. Madison sued and he won the case. As you can see, he sued for $5,000 in damages. He was only awarded $100, but the win was considered an important victory for racial justice at the time. Now we're gonna talk about a, couple, a few couples that made a big impact on Ames. Archie and Nancy Martin might be a name that some of you are familiar with. They're formerly enslaved in Georgia and arrived in Ames in 1913. And they advocated for allowing black students to live on Iowa State campus. Archie and Nancy mentored, supported black students attending Iowa State at their house at 218 Lincoln Way in the 1920s through the 1950s. <clears throat> you can see a picture of them on the right there along with their house. <clears throat> so how they got to Ames, Local Ames doctors, D Dr. David and Dr. Jenny Greist, who was our first female physician in Ames, were touring the South on vacation and ate some of Nancy's cooking at a local restaurant. They encouraged Nancy to move to Iowa and the couple began to relocate their family around 19, in the early teens. After moving to Ames, Archie was hired as assistant yardman for the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad. Nancy worked as a cook for the Greist family and a fraternity on campus. We are unsure what fraternity though, the records are very uh, incomplete. <clears throat> so they, Archie and his, Archie also had some experience plastering. So him and his sons built this house. Here you can see in the bottom corner, it still exists today. Um, it's an important example of craftsman style bungalow on Lincoln Way, which was once lined with residential homes interrupted by a few scattered gas stations at intersections. And, um, it's one of the, the very few remaining houses on Lincoln Way in that section uh, um, since they demoed one on the north side just a few years ago. And it's registered local historic landmark. Now at that time, um, black students were not allowed to live on campus. They were allowed to attend school and it was kind of one of those unwritten rules. They were, it was an unofficial policy. So housing for these students was very difficult to find. So seeing this gap in housing, Archie and Nancy offered up their home to these students and supported and mentored them living there. They advocated for an end to the policy that disallowed students of color from living on campus. Nellie and John Shipp. Now, ne uh, Nellie is actually, she was one of the, the children of uh, Archie and Nancy Martin. And they got married in 1910 and moved to Ames following their parents. The couple had seven children. Many of the, the boys enlisted in World War II and some of them even went through Korea and had long-term careers at the Pentagon. Now, John worked for many years, I think 48 years, he worked at the Sheldon Munn Hotel, starting as a waiter, going to maintenance staff and eventually becoming the hotel and uh, main engineer. And that hotel was only open for about 65 years as a hotel. The building's still there today. So of those 65 years, John Shipp was really steering it and making sure that everything was working all right in there for all 48 of those. It was a very popular hotel, booked ahead, months ahead of time for social gatherings. And its uh, success prompted an expansion of the structure in 1928. So here are, here's a nice photo of the, of the Shipp family together. And here you'll see the ship home and the Sheldon Munn Hotel there. So along with the Martins, the ships also advocated for equal treatment of black students regarding camping campus housing. Uh, family tradition holds that Archie and John went several times to discuss the matter with presidents of Iowa State College. And by the early 1950s, the unofficial policy preventing students of color from living on campus waned. Uh, many students who lived at the Martin and Ship House became leaders in their fields, including James Bowman, who was a Tuskegee Airman during World War II and later a Des Moines School Administrator, and also Samuel Macy, who worked on the Manhattan Project. Our last person, someone I'm sure most people have heard of, Jack Trice. John Jack Trice was born in 1902, and he was the first Black athlete at Iowa State. 
competing in football and track, and he died in 1923 from injuries occurred at a college football game in Minnesota. Born in, born in Ohio, 1902, uh, he excelled in sports under coach Sam Williman um, in high school sports. When Sam Williman was, was appointed head football coach at Iowa State College, he invited six of his former players, including Trice, to join him, making him the first af black athlete. Trice majored in animal husbandry and planned to use his degree to help Southern black farmers, much like uh, George Washington Carver. He did well in school and worked to fund his education. Um, in 1923, an Iowa State varsity football game traveled to University of Minnesota in Minneapolis for an away game on October 6th. Trice suffered a broken collarbone during the game, on one of the first plays of the game, and he insisted on continuing to play in the third quarter, he was trampled by Minnesota players and taken out of the game. The doctor declared him fit for travel and he rode the train back to Ames with the rest of the team and his condition soon wor worsened after they left. He died of internal bleeding caused by his injuries on October 8th, 1923. You can see him in his football uniform there. Um, Iowa State canceled classes for the day for memorial service, which you will see on the bottom right corner there with the Campanile and his uh, casket was draped in cardinal and gold. Uh, his death resulted in Iowa State refusing to renew its contract to play the University of Minnesota, and they didn't play another football game against each other for 66 years. Uh, in 1973, as they were um, transitioning to the new football stadium on what we know as University Avenue today, there was a student-led campaign to, to rename the stadium after Jack Trice. But unfortunately, it did not um, go over it did not happen. They named it Cyclone Stadium. But it, um, in 1974, the first year they played on it, they did name the field Jack Trice Field. And it wasn't until after numerous decades long campaign awareness, mostly done by the student body, to rename the entire stadium Jack Trice Stadium in 1997. And it remains the only Division I stadium in the nation named in honor of a Black student athlete. Um, now, in combination with this, with the um, banner that was put on the side of the building, we've we've decided to um, feature these individuals in our next exhibit. So we've been fortunate enough that Alex and his club were, allowed us to use some of their design to tell more of these stories because we can only tell so much on that banner. And we thought, you know what, this is this is so great. So we've kind of taken that that banner project and expanded it. And so starting um, September 1st, you can come to the Ames History Museum and see Black Trailblazers. We're going to tell you a little bit more information about these people. I, you know, I couldn't tell you everything today. Um, we're going to feature more photos, more stories. And also one of the big uh, eye-catching things is we are going to make uh, probably about a half-scale replica of Miss Ames, the Herman Banning plane. And you'll be able to kind of stand behind it in the cockpit and take your picture just like you were there. So we're really looking forward to that. It's kind of been... We've just started this week uh, dis dismantling our last exhibit, and this one's starting to go in. So please feel free to tune in and come back in September 1st at the Ames History Museum. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. Thanks so much, Alex. And now no we'll problem. let the other Alex and Helen take it away, and then we will do questions kind of all together at the end. Awesome. All right, take it away. That sounds wonderful. I'm definitely marking my calendar for September 1st to be able to come check out that plane. So definitely count me in, I'll be there. <laughs> awesome. So I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen. Okay, yep. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna have to jump around for a second. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Um, um, I might need, okay, awesome, thank you. You're welcome, sorry, I realized you needed probably a vocal as well as a visual confirmation. I appreciate that a lot. Well, thank you. So we are Graphic Science Social Club. I definitely skipped over that first slide. So uh, this is a collaboration with the Ames History Museum uh, for the project, um, No History, Create a Better Future. And so I am Helen Barton, as I was wonderfully introduced at the beginning, I appreciate that. And I was previously uh, the president of Graphic Design Social Club, now continuing to remain and work very closely with 
the club in the area. And Alex Braidwood is our advisor and um, a firm supporter in everything we do as a club. And also a little bit about the, the project is this project was um, an opportunity brought to us by Jordan Brooks, the multicultural liaison officer for the College of Design. And so he connected with Alex about this project and uh, then we really began discussing it as an opportunity for the club. And a little bit more about the club, we really focus on building community through design. And so being able to work on this project and go beyond the bounds of the Iowa State community into working with the larger Ames community was really important for this project and a way for us to uh, raise awareness and you know potentially impact change. So very grateful to be a part of this project. Awesome. All right, and so a little bit more about the people that were part of this project. Um, going across the top line, myself and then Darby Shaw. Uh, Darby was definitely one of the key designers and leaders within this project. Um, she is very passionate about all things graphic design and social justice and, and really was at the forefront of making this banner happen. Um, John Marquis was another really influential student. Um, he was a large part uh, of the illustrations that you've seen of uh, the faces of all the different key figures in Ames's history. And then um, on the bottom, at, on the left, we have Ani Wright. Um, Ani was a large part of the brainstorming at the beginning, being able to um, establish a direction, our core values as a team connected to this project. And then Barsha Poodle, Barsha was very influential when it came to the end. The brainstorm was at the beginning and then at the end as we began developing our, our patterns. So I just wanted to highlight that this was not a project done in a silo. There was a wonderful number of people on the team making this happen. And so as we started out the project, we really wanted to start by digging into the values and goals uh, connected to this initiative and the way that we were reflecting and connecting with it as individuals. And so one of the first things that Alex facilitated was a session, collaborative brainstorm session to really talk through these goals. We started thinking about our keywords and phrases, um, connecting these to what we'd heard in the project description, as well as how those were resonating with our personal experiences um, and concepts in conjunction with this project. And all together, you can see here, some of the words were strong, striking, visually appealing, and the idea of a common respect, um, both for the people we were representing, the histories, and then everything they mean for the Ames community. So farther along with this collaborative brainstorm, we started digging into the different values and after accumulating a list, then being able to rank those in terms of the priority and how we wanted to then highlight those moving forward into uh, the visual and the banner. So this was a altogether a very collaborative project that and a value that we continue to emphasize ourselves um, was to bring as many voices to the table um, and influences as we start to share this history. And the next part of this project was where we started building on a visual style collection. This style collection was inspired by those goals and values and really started to dig into the ones that we had highlighted and emphasized to think about the inspiration and visual styles in the world that we might be connecting those to. And the first one of those is diversity. And so for this one, this is just a selection of the different images that were collected by the folks on our team in the brainstorm. You can see everything from illustrations to collage um, to text in the shape of hands or other words. And so it was really amazing just to see all the influences from different people as we started this process. Beyond that, we also started looking into shapes um, color and meaning and how those were working together to create messages. This continued to come through with patterns at different scales, with different levels of detail. And I'll just I'll go through these a little bit quicker. So we have 
talking about growth, um, themes of whether it's trees, roots, um, people building collaborative, collaboratively doing something, but definitely the idea of people and um, their role in growth was really Im impactful. Another big theme was networking. Just thinking about the network that these community members created for the Black students in Ames at the time, and then all the generations after that, um, being inspired by the history and the impact that they've made in this community, as well as the fact that their, their networks go beyond um, just Ames with the sphere of influence that they had. Another one is evolution and strength. And so with these visuals, we really started digging into shapes and abstracting it more to think about what the, the patterns or, or broader themes we might be seeing were. And so these are just a couple different examples of some of the patterns that we started exploring. And if you keep an eye out, you might see how these influence some of the design later in the process. Let's click through these. And so after this, we started digging into the visual ideation in the first phase. Um, and so as a part of this, we started looking at the photos that were provided. Um, and I have a little bit more to say about this, but Alex, I'll just check in. Is there anything um, that you wanted to add as we, as we got to this point in the process? Yeah, this was a good spot where we were really trying to give visual form to these abstract ideas. So thinking about how that language comes together was really important for us as a group to ensure that the different perspectives were represented and, and that we were thinking about how to give something uh, in a way tangible to these to these relatively abstract ideas. And so yeah, that's a that's a perfect transition now to thinking about how do we um, represent individuals based on these these photo assets. Yeah, great job so far, Helen. Thank you. And so exactly like Alex said is that when we started this project, there was a, a large range of assets that we received from the Ames History Museum. And so then in transitioning, being able to use these photos and the visual information that they presented about these people um, to carry that forward into a representation in the banner was really important. And as I tap through these as well, you can see all the photos are very different. They're very different in the framing or um, the person's angle, uh, maybe how far away they are from the camera. Um, certain people had more assets uh, than others when it came to this. And so it was, it was a unique challenge to really uh, pause and reflect on how we were gonna be able to represent these people and also capture, capture their impact and power um, and sphere of influence that they've had. And this, this was a really um, amazing experiment that we started digging into um, when it came to that visual representation. Um, and so Alex, I'll turn it over to you for these next couple of slides. Yeah, we were playing around with levels of abstraction. So um, this actually involved a, a bit of a workshop where we were using some programming to process some of the images, just as a way to play around with the forms that were being generated, the level of recognizability that comes about. So what you're watching is, uh, it's actually a program that analyzed the image um, and then was representing it at these different levels of abstraction. And if you go through, there's a, the next one uh, includes some color. So here we're introducing the, um, the colors from the Ames History Museum uh, branding style guide, which that's an aspect that becomes very important a bit later in the process as we start to make some final decisions. It's, it's necessary that all of those decisions are rooted in the um, the style guide uh, and the branding uh, elements from the, the Ames History Museum. So it maps to the, um, to the broader sort of um, ways in which the museum represents itself visually. Mm -hmm. Completely agree. And that's a wonderful transition that after those experiments and thinking about levels of abstraction, then we started leaning into the idea of illustration. Um, right before we got there, these were some experiments from Darby and John where they were looking into um, how they were representing these people, adding texture and color um, to, to simplify the image so that we could really focus on the essence of the people being represented. And so there were more experimentations with 
the color and the background and how to really um, make these people resonate. Um, and in this case, it's really interesting too, um, how we're also starting to explore text and how this fits into the larger story. A large part of our process throughout this project was being able to experiment and try new things, whether it was areas that we hadn't explored before in our classes or in other projects we've been a part of. And so this was a fantastic opportunity to do that. And the Ames His Museum team was always um, welcoming and encouraging of that exploration. So uh, a factor that we were incredibly grateful for during this whole collaboration. And so moving forward, after those initial experiments, you can see all the different directions that we went in. Um, we began to solidify the route that we would use to represent these people visually. And so looking, just looking at those photos um, and being able to dig into them, that one being who we just heard in much more detail about, um, Banning and his plane, the Miss Ames, and looking again at Jack Trice and his photos and the ships, Miss Ewing. Yeah, okay, I just keep clicking through, watch my eyes. So as we got this started, this was one of the first illustrations that we worked on. And so what was fantastic about this illustration is that um, John and Darby explored was looking at the shapes, looking at the, the people and being able to really focus on different elements of, of their character and, and pull that through. So what you'll see is a definite exploration using a reduced numbers of, of color to then really focus on the essence of the people. I'll just click through a couple of days. And so those, these four were done all by John Marquis. And then again, once we had established the colors, the, the turquoise tones that were gonna be used for the illustrations of the people themselves, then finding ways to introduce um, back into that story, the really warm colors that are also a part of the Ames History Museum's branding. Um, and as Alex said, really connecting that to uh, the story of the Ames History Museum, digging into and really exploring um, the history of all these folks. This one there. And so this next series was done by Darby Shaw. And what's also really interesting is that both Darby and John have a very different style of illustration. However, within the same theme, it works very cohesively together. And you can kind of see their, their interpretations and um, nuance when it comes um, to the different representations within this style too. And just before we dig into to the typography, um, Alex, if you have anything else to add to the illustration story? Yeah, the, you know, whenever you're illustrating a person, there's a lot of things you have to take into account uh, because very small details can, can make a very big difference. You know, as humans, we're very attuned to small differences from one person to another. That, that's how we can easily tell each other apart in a lot of ways. And so being able to have students who are illustrating um, you know, the, these figures remaining recognizable through the illustration and again, utilizing the brand colors in order to represent them, that was a really, it was a really interesting challenge. And the other aspect to that is it's a lot of figures to fit on a banner on the side of a building at scale that you can still see it from far away. So it introduced some really interesting design challenges. Uh, that I that I think the students handled uh, really well. Yes, that that's actually a fantastic point um, that you brought up again was the the yeah, aspect of scale. This is the first time that many of us had worked on that size, and you'll see that comes into play later as we have the picture of us assembling it or the picture of the folks putting it on the wall. Is that um, the document that we worked in and trying to calculate that the type or the piece of text that looked really small on our screen was actually going to be two feet tall when it was printed. So that was a really wonderful opportunity for us to work in, in mediums that we are not normally working in in our classes. And so again, just feeding into the idea and grateful for the opportunity to experiment, learn, and explore. And so on the part about typography, 
Um, for us as graphic designers, the type and the fonts that we use are really important. And working on this project, it was an opportunity for us to dig into very intentionally where we were getting our uh, typefaces from. And that's what we call fonts as graphic designers. And so a part of that story was being able to use typefaces from vocal type. Um, vocal type is run by Trey Seals and I'll hand over to Alex in a second to talk more about that. But he is a um, black typographer and type designer. And the history of these typefaces is also really important. And so being able to work on this project that was highlighting um, the history of really impactful Black people in Ames's history um, made us even more conscious and intentional about some of the choices that we were making on a visual level. And so Alex, I'll, I'll hand it over to you for more of that background. Yeah, uh, you pretty well covered it. I mean, we just wanted to make sure that all the elements that we had control over were as related to the spirit and the theme and the mission of this poster as possible. And, and as graphic designers, it's our job to be concerned about what does the typeface represent? Where does it come from? Who uh, designed it? Who benefits from the licensing of it in order to put it into the work? Uh, and so uh, I think what Helen has on the next slides is uh, going to demonstrate where those typefaces uh, come. Oh, this is Trey Seals here. Um, so, you know, amazing typographer, definitely check out his website, find him on Instagram. He does really amazing work and it's, it's, it's historically inspired in the same ways that the mission and the vision of this banner were. Uh, and so, uh, you know, what Helen's going to show next about how she, um, narrowed down which typefaces she was going to choose sort of play into that, that history. Yes, absolutely. And so as Alex said about that history, each of the typefaces that are on vocal types website are um, inspired by specific strikes or protests. And they are very similar or identical to the typefaces that the protesters were using at those specific events. And so for example, this one is called Martin and it is um, a nonviolent typeface as it reads here, inspired by the remnants of the Memphis sanitation strike of 1968. And so, what was really important thinking about the history of these typefaces is the people, the collective energy and um, the resistance to uh, factors and um, society that in, in many ways wasn't supporting them. And as um, Alex shared earlier in the presentation from the Ames History Museum, um, thinking about the challenges that many of these folks had to overcome. And so the story of where these typefaces come from lovely, is really important. The second one is another example. This is a typeface, Marsha. And it, this was from the 1960s and representing the different protests that were in conjunction with um, the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, so representing and really highlighting a, a, another narrative of resistance um, in a different sphere. And so again, the power of these typefaces and then what the energy we were bringing forth with them in this project. So these were some of our initial explorations, just starting to put the words together with the Ames History Museum logo, start thinking about how they would work in conjunction. And this was actually one of the slides that we had in our, in our check-in with the Ames History Museum. And it was really amazing to be able to share with them the reasons why we had chosen the typefaces that we had and be able to hear from them the impact that it had to the project in general and, and having that intention moving forward. So the opportunity for, for shared learning and being able to um, give our knowledge back and forth was amazing. And so now moving towards the final banner. As you, um, as you might have noticed, in the background of the banner, there are all kinds of different patterns. The patterns that we chose were very intentional, connected to the people who they were behind. And so these patterns behind the ships, thinking about you know, the impact they had with housing and um, with the students living in the Ames community. Thinking we also were intentional of choosing the planes behind Herman Banning, 
And we also chose very geometric patterns, which if you might notice just from the top of this illustration, um, the shapes there are very fluid, they're rounded, they're organic shapes. And in, in contrast with the very linear geometric patterns in the background. So as graphic designers, we also had a great opportunity there to experiment um, with some contrast and some layering to add more visual information and um, meaning to each of these people's stories and really highlight the individual nature of the impacts that they have had. And another part of this is that the different people worked on these patterns. So as I mentioned, Barsha Poodle was very influential with creating these patterns, um, such as the pattern for peanuts um, that was behind GWC. And so it's maybe um, in case you hadn't noticed the patterns before, uh, the next time you go and check out the banner, uh, make sure to go and look a little bit closely because each of them have very unique uh, shapes and interactions with everybody there. Uh, another thing we wanna emphasize is that um, a lot of times when we think about uh, women in history, they're very closely connected to um, their husbands. And so we really, in the illustration process, we were very intentional about giving each couple their own space, their own arch um, that they filled and their own piece of history about them. Um, just to be able to recognize the impact that the men had as well as, as, well as the women um, in the history of Ames in this way. Alex, is there anything that you'd like to add to this final banner slide before we keep digging deeper? I think you covered it on that one. Yep. And if you go to the next one, that just zooms into to each individual one, so or each individual set, so that you can see um, sort of how those textures play in. But I, I think that that division was really important. That that made the narrative of how these individuals contributed to the community much. Uh, it, it made it a very strong narrative. Mm -hmm. Yes, I completely agree. And so this was a fantastic picture um, that Alex took as the banner was getting put up on the wall. And so again, just thinking about the scale that we've been working at the whole time on our computers and that being translated to, you know, an eight foot plus banner that's on a wall and being able to, to be a part of the whole process from after it was, after we'd finished it on the computer, then Darby was responsible for creating some proofs and uh, coordinating with Alex to do that. So we could see strips of the vinyl that it would be printed on, be able to make any final changes to the colors or the shapes or anything else, but all of that went really smoothly. And so the next part was just continuing to collaborate with the print shop to get it printed at this scale and then get it assembled and added to downtown Ames. I would say another really important part of this story is that we were able to get this considered as a piece of art. And so as a piece of public art, it's going to be in downtown Ames for a much longer time. It's going to be quite a few months that it's going to be there. So again, as a powerful part of that history to have worked very deeply on the history of all of these folks, the impact we've had on Ames, and now to have that continue to influence and impact the community for quite some time to come out in um, downtown Ames is amazing. And so this was just a couple of the photos from that day of installation and then the ribbon cutting ceremony that was facilitated um, by the team and uh, Ames History Museum. What was really wonderful was there were so many different family members from the people that were on the banner. And, you know, we didn't know that so many would be coming out. So to have worked and understood the history, but then hear from their descendants, their children or grandchildren, how much it meant to have these people represented and their stories heard in downtown Ames was incredible and just continued to emphasize um, the significance of this project and for the community. All right, and there is, and just the visual part that you see on the banner is not all. So Alex, I'll hand it over to you for the augmented reality portion. As Yeah, as we were thinking about this opportunity to have uh, you know, this mural on the side of the building in downtown, 
we also started thinking like, well, what are some of the other opportunities? What are other ways in which we can provide access to this information? What are ways we can make it a fun activity? Can we do something that can bring some of the content even a little bit closer to individuals on the street, to families, to kids? You know, because when you do something uh, in public, you have to take certain precautions against, um, you know, vandalism and just, you know, making sure that it's above arm's reach for, you know, in incidental um, damage and, and things like that. So knowing that it was going to be sort of like up high uh, and quite large, we're thinking like, is there another way that we could uh, provide access to some of this information? So Helen, if you want to go to the next slide, what we created is an AR layer. So if you use the app, the app is called Artivive, uh, and it's a free app. It's available on iPhone and Android. Um, you, can, you can download it. And then when you look at this banner through that app, so here's uh, Helen and Darby looking at the banner through the app. If you want to go to the next slide, it's kind of an over the shoulder picture. So you point your phone at the banner. And then if you want to go to the next slide, what you see is you see a motion graphics piece that plays in place of the banner that animates through and bring some of that information that's on the on the mural right down to you on your phone as you move around. It moves around in the space. It's just it's a way to utilize uh, this really accessible technology to to add in some more information. You can see their graphics a little bit better. You can see the information a little bit better. Um, and so, if you want to go to the next slide, um, I know the video may play a little choppy on Zoom, but we've made like a little we made a one minute documentary video about how the augmented reality works. So I think if we just click it one more time, it'll go. this is after that video is amazing just digging into that in more detail and then this is the photo of um, the folks from the graph design social club side as well as uh, some of the folks from the Ames History Museum side and uh, that were a part of this project um, this is wonderful coming and seeing it come to fruition all right Alex you're about to say something anything else to add Nope, I think you got it. All right. So that that's all. I'd say thank you so much uh, to the Ames History Museum for um, welcoming us into this project, for encouraging our creativity and exploration. And um, by all means, if you're curious about the Graphic Science Social Club and what we do, please feel free to uh, check us out on social media um, at GD Social Club or um, reach out to either um, Alex or myself uh, we'd be happy to provide our information. So thank you. Yeah, thank you all so much. And we actually have quite a few questions too for kind of both the Alex's and Helen. So that's great. Um, so the question that I'm seeing the most is a lot of folks are curious about how long the entire like design and production process took for the banner. And also like difficulties that you may have had to overcome along the way. Yes, uh, so the production process um, did take a couple months to get started. Um, Alex, do you remember the exact month when we had started um, the first email contact and kickoff meeting? Um, yeah, I want to say that it was about, I mean, it was about a five month process from start to finish, just with the, between the onboarding, the learning, um, some of the design iterations, managing semester university schedules, um, so yeah, it was about, I would say it was about a five month uh, design and ideation process. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you also mentioned the the challenges in there. I think the some part of the challenge was, I mean, just the world was going definitely going through a reckoning in that time. So um, as students, then being able to be part of this project was amazing. Being able to try to balance it between work, um, our schoolwork, and everything else um, in our lives. However, I will say it also brought a lot of joy to have the, the group of us that were continuing to connect and collaborate and, and really know that it was going to come into fruition. It was going to be um, a wonderful gathering space for people in downtown Ames. Um, and beyond that, I think we really just learned a lot as the all the different graphic designers on the team learning, experimenting in different media um, with illustration and skills that we might have been interested in but hadn't explored further before. Um, so that was a fantastic opportunity to dig into. Um, but yeah, the, the learning that came with it too. And another question kind of about the physical process of the mural. Um, someone is wondering about um, what you might have done to see about getting it to resist weathering and will last kind of over time and the challenges that come with outdoor public art like that. I can answer that one a little bit. So that's, that all comes down to the materiality. So these are, um, this is, you know, all weather vinyl printing. Um, it, it's the, the whole structure is designed to be, um, you know, installed outside and, and last for quite a long time. Uh, the colors are intended to stay quite vibrant. We also are benefiting from the side of the wall that it's on, that it doesn't get lots of direct sunlight for uh, a lot of the months out of the year. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's just a lot of like, um, as a designer, talking to the people who are going to be producing it. So we had really great conversations uh, and introductions with the uh, the people at the sign company who are going to be working on it, um, you know, they are experts in, in their territory. So when, you know, the Ames History Museum and some designers come to them and say, hey, we need a thing that's going to last for X number of months, you know, they're total pros and, and they, they know how to address it. But yeah, the, 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 the substrate that it's printed on and the printing technology used to print it, it's, it's, it's built exactly for that. Thank you have a question for the other Alex, which is um, someone is wondering if the ship home is still standing and where it is in Ames. The ship home is no longer standing. It was at uh, two, 218 Sherman Avenue. Um, it's now a, um, a small strip mall. It's kind of located if you're from those like kind of behind McDonald's, there's a Prince coffee shop and a uh, um, a small little um, kind of grocery store kind of thing in there. So it's it's been gone for quite a few years now at this point. It's very it's in the very kind of more industrial side where South Duff is kind of in, South Duff and Lincoln Way have been just encroaching on that area pretty heavily. Um, we had someone else who was asking about Jack Trice and if like the tr him getting injured and kind of to that extent was intentional or if there were any kind of racial motivations or if we just don't know we just don't know i think it's one of those questions if you if you ask an iowa state fan they will say yes if you ask a minnesota fan they'll probably say no um there was i believe one newspaper account that did mention it it had implications like that but um i think it's one of those questions we'll just never quite know i don't think we can ignore the fact that he was the only african-american on the field and was probably targeted at some point in the game if not during that point but unfortunately it's one of those things that we'll maybe never have a for sure answer to but yeah and i do i see someone commented earlier bob where i want to i did uh say the wrong date for when it was jack trice field it was in uh in the 80s, not in the 70s. I just mis misread that off my notes. All right, and we have another question that just came in, which is, are there any plans at this point to use components of the banner design in other ways, either at Ames History Museum or in kind of different materials, things like that? Yeah, I mentioned our, on my last slide. Um, we're go this is gonna be, we're turning this banner into a full-blown exhibit. So we're, we are grateful that the uh, design club allowed us to use their, like to take their bits that they design 
and kind of blow them out and show them in a different in a different way to you know using their, their fonts that they chose and all that and of course we're going to have a nice panel at the front talking about how this why is this exhibit here because we did this banner with with this with the group that led to that and so we're going to make sure they get some great credit at the beginning of front for for doing all that design work which is an exhibit builder is like the ultimate for someone to do all the the hard design work for you already so we we appreciate that we just thought it was such a great the visuals are so captivating the i i really can't wait to get some of that dark blue color paint on our walls and start putting some of these um the the assets you guys put on there and really have them pop out so That'll be in September. September 1st, it's opening to the public at the Ames History Museum. So check our check our hours to come and see that. And we're it's it's starting. We ju we just demoed the last exhibit this week. So we're we're slowly getting into the mode where it'll start looking a little bit more like the next exhibit. So stay stay tuned. I can't wait to come see it. It's gonna be great. <laughs> yeah. Especially with that that Herman Banning uh, Miss Ames airplane we're re recreating. It'll be that'll be quite a fun thing to come in and see an airplane in the museum, that's for yeah, sure. Absolutely. Well, I think that is all of our questions. Do any of you have any final thoughts that you want to share? Um, Alex does. I do. I did. I wanted to share one thing, which is to express a lot of gratitude for the Ames History Museum. And, and when people work with designers in like a client designer relationship, there's a certain level of expectation and there's a, always a good level of collaboration and back and forth. But when you're working with students, students are amazing, but we as uh, you know, educators also have a lot of other pressures. And I just wanted to express a, a, a great amount of gratitude for the Ames History Museum for being willing to go on this adventure with students. As an educator, giving students the opportunity to make this project, to work together, to know that they're learning through the process. It's just, it's an amazing thing. And, and I'm just, I'm really, excited for the fact that you're continuing to use these elements but also just grateful that at the beginning you were willing to um, engage uh, you know us as a me as an educator but the students as as learners and it really means a lot to us thank you I, I don't think we could be any more happy with the results it's just amazing like it's just amazing we're blown but we're blown away at how nice it looks out there thank you so much and i'm excited to go take another look because i confess i didn't notice the background patterns and so now after this presentation, I'm going to have to go, go take another look. Well, thank you all so much for sharing all about the graphic design process, about the history. Um, it was really great to have you all. And that's going to conclude our program. Thanks to everybody who attended. Have a good night. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Have a good thank night, everyone. Thanks for <laughs> hanging out. <laughs>